theyeshiva.net. Okay, good morning, everybody. To one and all. We'll continue inside. The line starts Makifim 198, column 1, or Tzadik Tess, column 3. After a bracket, a long bracket, we're holding Velachei Nema Bedavit. 18 lines up. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. In the brackets, it was a long footnote about Nasa and Nishma, about the first parish of Kriyashma, the second parish of Kriyashma, about Loisasa versus Ase, and about why Yitzchak gave the brachas in a way that were beyond what seemed like without his das or beyond his das. Similar to Shikha, which is Shaloy Ladatenu. He spoke about the two crowns, Nasa and Nishma, which represent the two dimensions of Keser. That's why there's two crowns, Shneik Sarim. Somebody the Kavart, why there's two crowns, the two levels of Keser. And that's the difference of Nasa and Nishma. Nishma is, uh, we will listen, but then there's Nasa, which is even deeper the bitl of the das also. And that's higdimu, because it's rooted in the kadmain, in the source of everything. And that's really oisin ritzayin shalmakim, accessing the ultimate ratzin, raiva the chal raivin. And that's why the second parish is called ein oisin ritzayin shalmakim. Because one is not, it's v'hoyim shamaya, it's missing that element. In the brackets, I didn't finish, I'll just do one more line there. He speaks about the brachas that came from Yitzchak, beyond Das. Right, uh, I'm a few lines before the end of the brackets. The source of these brachas is what's called, the expression is do that flows from Atik. The tal, tala, is like do. The notif that trickles, that flows. Notef is it, it flows down. Me'atik of Amatik. V'zeo shekosav b'medrash. This is what it says in medrash. Reyach b'gadov, reyach b'gadov. It's a very short line here, but very deep. It says that when Yaakov came in to Yitzchak, v'yorach es reyach b'gadov. He smelled the aroma of his clothes, and he said, re'ei reyach b'ni, ah, observe, Experience the aroma of my son. It's like the f- smell of a field that God blessed. The Medrash Rabba says on the words, In a Sefer Torah, there's no Nikudus. There's no vowels. We have a tradition how to pronounce it. But the fact is you could pronounce many words in different ways. And the fact that you could pronounce them in different ways means that that's part of the interpretation of the text. In other words, we often don't realize this, every possible way to read a word is actually a way to read a word. Because you're dealing here with infinity, infinite wisdom. So every possibility that exists in the text is part of the text. That's why the Chazal will often do this. al tikri b'gadov el I can read, he smelled the reyach of his clothes. But that's because I choose to read it begadov. That's our tradition. In the Sefer Torah, there's no Nikudas. There's another way of reading it. Reyach boigdov. You know what the boged is? A traitor. In Yiddish, it's called afareter. Boged is somebody who betrays. Huh? No, no, that's a maser. A boged, yeah, bgida. It's betrayal. Somebody who betrays his country, somebody who betrays his, his, his spouse, somebody who betrays his family, somebody who betrays his company, but it's just a boged. Yeah. It's treason. Treason is an act of good. So Yitzchak smelled, not the smell of his clothes, the smell of his traitors, of his bogdim. And he said, ah, look at the smell. What's going on? Why, why, why are you so impressed with bogdim? Why, why are you so impressed? But, but, but traders are not. You, thank you so much. Traders are not usually seen in a in, in a good light. This is almost like why he's giving him the blessings. 
So the Balatanya teaches she obchines tshuva, she lemaylem obchines reyach begadov she obchines levushim. There's two things happening simultaneously. On a level of das, what he observes is garments. That levushim. What's levushim? Levushim is makif hakarif. On a deeper level, he's observing boigdov those who betray the tra- the traitors of Kalal Yisrael who open up the path of tshuva, because through their begida, they can ultimately transform themselves. This is a much higher place. That's what Yitzchak smelled. It's Gamkenes. Gamkenes is both. It's gam- when he says, gam- yeah. he has told enough me. No, no, Gamkin he meant, we spoke before about uh, Nasev and Nishma, and then Atik and Shnei Ksarim, so this explains another dimension where we see this playing itself out in Yiddishkeit. Just like we spoke before about Shikha. Here he's adding, that's the Reyach Boigdav. It's a different smell. Now you wouldn't think this aroma is pleasant, but it's essentially what the Medrash is saying, that from the Boigdav of Klal Yisrael, he understood why you should bless Yaakov. In other words, the reason, the greatest incentive to bless Yaakov is when he smelled the smell of the Boigdav. Those who are the furthest away, those who are the greatest traitors, l'cha'oida, but deep down, there's still a very deep connection, and essentially the begida will only lead to tshuva. That's what we discussed at length yesterday. So even pre, this was the primius, ah? What? The bracha itself, you said the bracha itself. The bracha itself, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you're saying the bracha itself empowers them, yeah. Boged, you never heard the word? <laughs> when Yaakov came in, he smelled the reyach of the boigdom of Klal Yisrael. The Medrash brings two examples. A man named uh, Yosef Meshissa. And a man, another man named Yaakov Mishtreides. Yosef, the Medrash tells two stories about two people to describe Boigdim. The Medrash Rabbin told us there was a man named Yosef Meshissa. He was a Roman accomplice. He liked, he dealt, he was buddy-buddy with the Romans. In other words, he went on to the enemy side because that's where the, you know, you got to follow the trail of the money and the power usually to see why he went. So he went. When they came to this Beis Hamikdash, they needed a tour guide to be able to show them what's tutzich in the Beis Hamikdash. It was a complicated structure, so they needed somebody on the inside to give them a tour of this, this, this. So who did they get? They got Yosef Meshissa. He was the tour guide for the Romans to show every room and everything and where this is and this is put and this is put. You know, you need somebody on the inside in the bank. You know, when you rob a bank, you need somebody who tells you, you know, where all the safes are and how to get into the safe. Yosef Meshissa was a Jew. He knew the Beis HaMikdash. They told him that there's going to be a reward for it. They're going to reward him nicely. So um, he took them in and he showed them around, etc. They said, what do you want for a reward? He said he wants the, he wants the Menaira. He wants to take the Menaira. It's like a lost custom. It was a nice piece. So they said, the Menorah not. They're not going to give him the Menorah. He should go in. He takes out the Menorah. They tell him, ain't dark or shall head yet lishtamish bezu. You're a peasant at the end of the day, you know? You're a dirty Jew. You don't use this. This is not for you. Go in a second time and take out something else. He said, no, I'm not going in a second time. I'm not going in again. So they told him, we will give you the revenue of taxes for three years. The revenue that we collect for three years from the taxes, I assume in Judea. I don't think in the whole Roman Empire, but in Judea, the three years, we will give you. He said, no, no. Go in, get something. No. They said, why? So he said, I quote, Pam Achas, Pam 
I made my God angry once. You want me to make him angry a second time to go in again? And the, the Medrash continues that they murdered him. They killed him. And he was screaming, Oy, oy, sheichasti leboiri. This is the story. The Medrash says, this is what Yitzchak smelled when uh, Yaakov came. And this is the boigdim, the traitors of Kalal Yisrael. This was a traitor. This was the traitor of the Jewish people. The second story is a man named Yaakov Ishtzreides. He was a nephew of Rabbi Yossi ben Yoyezer Ishtzreide. We have him in Pekayov as the first chapter. In other words, much earlier in Bayashayi. He would go horseback riding on Shabbos. And the Gemara says, the, the Medrash says he had a whole conversation with Yossi ben Yezer Ishtzreide. And he was again a traitor of the Jewish people. And something got to him at the end. And he was mekayim on himself. It's a skill and sreif, a herik, chenek, and detail, what he did to himself. <sighs> and uh, Rabbi Yosef ben Yezer said that he came to Gan Eden before him. This nephew of his, who was one of the worst, came to Gan Eden before him. What's the matter trying to bring out from all these things? That when you see, where do you see the Jew? It's a very deep idea. Where do you see the real Jew? You don't see always the real Jew in the Jew who was Jewish. Because he's Jewish. In every religion you have people who are dedicated to their faith. Where you see the Jew is the Jew who, for all practical purposes, is completely not Jewish. Is alienated from Judaism on every level. And nonetheless, he's still Jewish. Which means that the connection is not one of das. You have in every philosophy, in every religion, people who dedicate their whole lives to this religion or philosophy, whether it's right or wrong, whether they're, they're, they're erring or they're not erring or they're partly erring, whatever it is, and they're ready to give up their lives for it. Mm. By Jews, you saw a chiddush in history that there were people, yeah. Daniel Pearl. You don't have to go so far. Unfortunately, we don't have to go far. Daniel Pearl was married to a non-Jew, to a Korean woman or an Asian. What were his last words? I'm a Jew, my father's a Jew, my mother's a Jew, I'm a Jew. Before the Islamist murderers did what they did to him. Yeah. You, had the, you had it in the Holocaust many times. People, their entire life, they're disconnected. So suddenly, what, you discovered something now? Mainly you have tzaddikim, rebbes, mekubalim, kedoshim, erlichin, their whole life, they're dedicated to God till death. You have people, their whole life, they laughed from it. <laughs> They mock. They were saying, you know, the boigdim. That's who Yaakov smelled. That means the relationship is not one that's defined by consciousness and experience. It means it's rooted in a place that's even beyond makif. Beyond rotsen even. I don't have a rotsen. Where is it? But, but suddenly you're the biggest Jew in the world. You're the greatest Jew in the world. Suddenly you stand up to the Roman Empire and you say, I'm going into the Beis Hamikdash again? Never. Are you... You? What happened suddenly? There's a beautiful word from the Panavijer of, of Kahneman. Shlomo Yosef Kahneman was the Panavijer of. He was the Rav of Panovich in Lithuania before the war. And then he, his family was killed. He was saved. He lived in Eretz Yisrael. He was a very special man. He once said over the Medrash, and he said, what happened, Taka? What happened? He, he went in as a tour guide, and he was ready to steal the Menorah. And then suddenly, so the Panavich Rav said, he went into the Beis HaMikdash. He went into the Beis HaMikdash, he was a changed man. He came out, he was a changed person. <laughs> he went into the Beis HaMikdash. He went into a place of Kedusha. There's an expression in Halach in Yeridea, min b'minoi, choyzer v'nir. When you meet your, uh, your counterpart, it triggers things that have never been triggered both in the negative and in the positive. Min he went into the base of Mikdash. Ain't a But he apparently knew by he was there once. Or he knew, or they thought he knew. Yeah, I said before he knew. I, it doesn't say in the Medrash, but I guess they, they, they chose him because... Uh, or it could, be helped, it could be that he helped them in other areas. Come to me, helped him. Another year, we said this was the reward. Go in and take. He went in. He wanted the menorah. He came out. He said he's not going in again. Because the lashon of the medrash is 
The way, it, the way he puts it is that when the enemies wanted to go into Harabayas, they said, let the Jew go in first. They chose him to go in first. And they said, go in, and whatever you take out is yours. So he took out the Menayit, and they didn't want to let him, and then he refused to go in again. There was a Jew, a German Jew. His name was Franz Rosenzweig. You ever heard the name? Franz Rosenzweig. Franz Rosenzweig was an intellectual, an academic. He lived in the early 1900s. Brilliant, brilliant Jew, and like so many German Jews, completely, completely assimilated and alienated from Judaism. And he was a well-known scholar in Germany, Rosenzweig. He decided to convert to Christianity, which was very, very common. In the 1800s especially, there were certain cities in Germany that 40 Berlin, I think 40% of Jews converted with, with volitionally, not, with, uh, not by force. This is uh, the 1800s. It was an opportunity for career, opportunity for integration. It didn't come from deep theology. It just came from uh, practical purposes, like, like assimilation in America, like intermarriage in America. Huh? Didn't reform Judaism start in Germany? In Germany, yeah. That's earlier, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. That was the beginning, yeah. That was the beginning of the end. So, he had a cousin, Rosenzweig, and he, he had a, a letter exchange. And the cousin writes to him that uh, before you convert, you should first just get a taste of Judaism. Just see, you know, see where you come from, and then you leave, you know. Say one last goodbye to mommy, and then you leave. So he said, it's not a good idea. It was Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur was coming. So the Maise Shahaya, we know the story from Franz Rosenzweig. There was a Belzer Stiebel, a little shul of Belzer Chassidim in Berlin. And he went there the night of Yom Kippur for Kol Nidre. He went there. He, he davened with them. He just stayed. He went. He came back the next day, Yom Kippur. And after Yom Kippur, he wrote to his cousin that uh, he's not converting anymore. And he became... A very, he became, he became a very serious Jew. He started to learn, he came close to Yiddishkeit. And instead, he wrote a whole commentary in German on Chumash and many other books on Judaism and Jewish philosophy in his own style. He passed away young, I think, in 1927. What happened over there? Then he went in, what happened over there? What happened was, there was no big lecture or debate, there was a Kol Nidre night. What happened was, he felt Kedusha. He never felt Kedusha before. His inner core, what we call the Makif Lamakif, <laughs> the Pnimi Yisakasar, the Boigid, it emerged, it triggered something. And it's not something he could necessarily explain rationally that before he had a question, now the question was answered. Sometimes it's not on that level. It's on a completely different level. But he experienced something at his core that he knew that everything else would be the greatest betrayal of his own self. That's what Yitzchak smelled. That's in a way something that the Boigid represents that the Tzaddik doesn't have. Not that the Boigid is uh, better than the Tzaddik, but the Tzaddik is, is involved in the program. The Boigid is not involved in the program. He's fighting the program. But Yitzchak smelled what's, what's deep, what's deep inside. And that's what brings him to give the bracha. And that's what he says. This Bogodov represents Levushim. That's Makif HaKarev. Boigdov represents Makif HaRachek, which is beyond Levushim. And those brachas that came beyond the Das of Yitzchak connected to that place of the Jew, which is Lamay Lamay Das. That's the connection between the two things. And that's the Koyach HaTshuva that comes from the Boigid because of Pnimius. Tshuva means returning. Returning to who? Returning to your own true self to your own core. That's what Yitzchak smells. Say to reveal the Yechidah of Nefesh. So to speak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yechidah is connected to Makif HaRachik. Yeah. There's a word from the Chidush Harim, the first Geri Rebbe. He has very short lines. He has it's maybe three, four lines. I don't know, two, three lines. Again, Parshas told us. So he says us a very powerful insight. I'm elaborating a little, just the way I understood it, but the nucleus comes from the Chidush Harim. He says that, why did Rivka have to deceive Yitzchak? Why couldn't she just tell him? 
Like we said, Rabbi Yitzchak, you know, Esav is not such a... <laughs> he's not as sweet as he looks. He's not as holy as he looks. I know him a little better than you. And uh, <laughs> at night, he's involved in not such nice things. Trust me, Yaakov is the man. Again, they can... And as we said, if you don't believe me, you have God. You can ask God. You'll see whose side he'll take. I mean, the women knew who was right. Sarah knew and Rivka knew. No, she had to do it this way. So the Chidush Shirim says as follows. It's... Uh, <laughs> He says, Rivka could have done that, and Yitzchak would have agreed, there wouldn't have been a problem. And Yitzchak would have told Yaakov, go, I'll give you the brachas. And what would have Yaakov done? You're going to get the brachas of Yitzchak? Yeah. Yaakov would go to the mikveh. Yeah. He would say Tehillim. <laughs> Maybe learn through Shas. <laughs> he would prepare. He would say L'Shem Yichud. He would put on the strimal and his, uh, his frak. And his gartel, yeah? And he would walk in to, to Yitzchak to receive the brachas. Huh? Etc. And Yitzchak would give him the brachas. And the Chidush Arim says, Gewaldek. But Rivke knew that one day there are going to be Jews who <laughs> will be very different. If she would have arranged what she wanted to arrange, who would have received the bracha? A Yaakov who looks like Yaakov. But there's going to be many Yaakovs who look like Esau's. They would be excluded from the blessing. So the Yiddish Mama, the ultimate Jewish mother who has long-term vision of history, knew that there's going to be a generation. And which generation understands this better than our generation? that maybe most Jews will be Yaakov, but externally they themselves won't know that they're Yaakov. If they're judging themselves based on their clothes, based on their outer performance or demeanor or disposition or social life or language or lifestyle, they're not connected. Rivka needed them to get the brach. Externally, externally they look like Esau. Mm -hmm. And they may even like that. It may be a great accomplishment. So Rivka needed Yaakov to be dressed up like Esau. That's the Jew who's getting the blessing. And what was the blessing? So he says, that's what Tal. Tal is Tal, the not of Matika. The Bryce also says, It's also a which is uh, Tal is Dor. Which represents that. The Gemara says, the Gemara says the difference between do and rain, that do never, uh, do doesn't end. Taloi metzer. Okay, I'll say from her, v'yitam l'chal l'kim, metal ha'shamayim. She says, metal ha'shamayim is mikra, mishman ha'aretz is mishnah, roiv dagim v'sirish is b'raisa, gemara. Yaakov wasn't just blessing him with dew and fat. And the, the Midrash says he was blessing him with Mikra and Chum Tanakh and Mishnah and Medrash and Gemara and Price. He goes through all the Psukim. So Rivka said, who, who, does, who gets this blessing? Judaism doesn't believe in Darwinism's survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest means that in natural selection, those who are fitted best to survive in the climate will survive. To use contemporary language, Judaism doesn't believe that the survival of Judaism exists only for the Jew who is the fittest to do it, meaning the Jew who's entrenched in Judaism, and that, that Jew will survive. Rivka understood that that's not the way it works. But for this, she had to dress up Yaakov Avinu. That's what did he smell? Yitzchak smelled. Who did he smell? He smelled Reyach Boigdov. Boigdov are those who appear like Esau. And that's who he gave the bracha to, and that's what touched him. Re'ei look at this aroma. That's the kaya chachuva, which is rooted in a place, l'maylam and hadas. That's the connection to everything we've been speaking about. How would that answer the fact that if Yaakov looked like Yaakov, there would still be the power of tshuva instinct in him. In other words, the provoke the traitorness, the externality, isn't it? I don't understand. The power of tshuva exists in every... Of course, but Yaakov didn't have to do tshuva. Ishtam, he was, he was there. So in other words, it's to bring out that potential. The, that potential, exactly. To bring out the potential in the one who looks like a boygut. Yeah. Yeah. When I moved to Muncie, 
somebody told me that uh, he was talking to me about his brother. So he said, my brother is a goy. My brother is a goy. So in my naivete, I thought he means literally. So I started to think, this is interesting. It's like a real Hasidic family. It was a second marriage. Like I'm just trying, I'm trying to figure out how his brother is a goy. Like I'm, I'm just making this whole thing in my mind. So I said, wow, your father went through some journey or your mother, like what, uh, you know, because this was like a serious, serious guy. It doesn't look like there was an intermarriage in the family. So he's, huh? <laughs> so he says, hey, my, my Buddha's a goy, a goy. I said, what, there was conversion like what? Till I figured out that in the culture where he came from, if somebody didn't uh, live according to the certain standards, he's actually called a goy. I never heard that before. It was a big chiddush for me. It was a big chiddush. <laughs> because the, the Yisoyed of Teres HaBal Shem Tev, one, one of the Yisoyed of Teres HaBal Shem Tev was this Nekudah, that uh, what he's bringing out here, the Reyach Boigdov, that Fakert, sometimes the Jew you see in that Jew more than any, everybody else, because L'cha'ayde he's so far, and yet there's a closeness. Huh? Yeah. So it was a, it was a Psa chiddush. When, when somebody calls a Jew who's secular, a guy, it's not just not true. It means that they don't understand what a Jew is even when it comes to them. They don't understand the Nekud of a Yid. By them, the Nekud of a Yid is, I dress a certain way. I do certain things, which are all amazing and beautiful. But he doesn't understand the Nekud of what a Jew is. What's the point of how we dress? Ah. How we dress? It's a It's a bush. It stops at the bush. <laughs> Um, or even, or even, even if he's talking more than Lavush, but v'lachein nema bedavid, v'lachein nema bedavid. That's why the pasuk says when it comes to David, v'hakimoisi lach bias neman. In Shmuel, the pasuk says about David Amelach, Hashem promises, "I will establish for you a bias neman." A faithful, enduring home. Shmuel Aleph, Pedek Chaf Aleph, and a few times in Shmuel Malachim, Hashem describes the Malchus of David, it's going to be a bias neman. A faithful, enduring home. A lasting home. Bias neman. Harei nikre b'chines malchus b'shem bias. The way he describes the kingship of David and his dynasty is, is defined as a bias, a home. Because Malchus is associated with bias. Hainu, Bipnesha Amar, because David Amalek said in Tehillim, Loigova Libi, my heart was never uh, arrogant. I'm just quoting the whole Pasuk. means that I always experienced myself as a suckling infant in the bosom of its mother. Nafshi kegomalalim, vidoimamti, from the word doimim, silent, like a, like a little infant embraced comfortably with so much love by its mother. And the infant is just relaxed, silent, eyes closed, in the middle of falling asleep and getting its nutrients from the mother's milk. So David HaMalach describes himself this way when he's already the king and the most powerful person in the country. He says, Loi gov alibi. My heart never grew arrogant. I always look at myself as the infant in the womb of its, in, in, the, in, the, in the bosom of its mother. Im loi shivisi mamti. You can tell me if it's not true that my soul remains silent like a gamul alay imay. A gamul is a suckling infant with its mother. He was such a great warrior. Huh? Oh, very good. Very good. So sometimes you have a person who by nature or by choice is, is meek. But David was anything but that. Meek is a shvachinke, you know, it's a type of person. <laughs> Push off. Just a, you know, less assuming and more subservient, uh, more docile, yeah, the sheep, right? But David HaMelech, Yuri Tanach, was anything but that. Yeah, in fact, and this is very interesting, and scholars who don't understand the depth of it always get confused. The David of Nevi'im and the David of Tehillim are two different people. Somebody once told me there's a schizophrenia. The David of Tehillim 
is the most pious, spiritual, emotional Jew who sits in a corner all day and just davens. It's an alta baba mit atilim yid. <laughs> Very good, atilim yid. It's like your great grandmother who sat in the shtetl, right, in a little chair by the corner. You ever read to him? You ever read to him? He doesn't stop. Everything is Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. You, you, everything is you. I rely only on you. The whole world is gonna, is gonna destroy me. You, you, you. You read the David of uh, of Nevi'im. He's a warrior. He's a statesman. <laughs> He's a battler. He's a courageous man. He takes on Goliath, right? The the mighty man of his time, Goliath. But then he moves on. David was a fearless person. Yeah, really, what he said? Uh, he killed the lion, he killed the bear. Uh, but no, yo, ben yo, yo, do you mean? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was, a, and, you, and you see it throughout the stories. His, he was a tremendous conqueror, a tremendous visionary. He's the one who united Klal Yisrael in their country. He's the one who established Yerushalayim as a capital. So you read the two Davids, it seems like different people, opposite people. Huh? But that's going to be the Oymek. So that's what he's going to say. Okemoy Habaye is just like a home. Nasim Ebchines Avonim Va'afar is made from stones, from rock and an earth. Shu Ebchines Doimem on one level, Avonim and Afar Adoimem, they're lifeless. But Vishar Shem Ebchines Makiv De Makiv but we said the bias is rooted in what's called the makif of makif. It's even higher than levushim and mazen. Kach malchus ibchina sfirah chrenet shabes sfirah datzilus. Malchus on one level is the lowest sphere in the ten spheres of atzilus with sharshum oid naila mibchinas makif the makif canal. But it's rooted. Its source is in a very sublime place. What we call the makif, which is even beyond the makif. The highest, the lowest. Right, and it's the highest that comes into the lowest of Malchus. And since David HaMelech represents Malchus, so the way Hashem describes his Malchus is always a bias neman, a home. I'm going to establish a home. And here we recall the three dimensions that are the vital components of human life, food, garments, and a home, which on one level, food is what you need most. It becomes part of you. That's your, your bloodstream. Garments are more external, and a house is even more external. Yet the house is the most expensive. Garments are least less expensive. Food is the least expensive. And he explained that the spiritual reason for this is based on another difference, and that is food. I don't eat a whole day. You eat one meal a day or two meals a day. A person could fast for a day or two. Garments, on the other hand, a person usually wears much of the day or most of the day or all of the day. But a bias, you'll have a home. Even when I'm not in a home, I have a home. Call me Shane Le Bayes, ain't the other. And the two differences are connected to each other. On one level, Mazen is closer to a person. But what makes it closer to a person? It becomes limited according to the chemistry of the person. It becomes the person and becomes depleted. It becomes consumed and you have to eat again. That's Mazen. That's what Mazen Pnimi is. Pnimi means it becomes the oxygen, like the oil of the flame that gets depleted because it gets consumed. By the, by the wick, it gets consumed by the flame. And you have to refill the jug with oil. Why? Because it becomes, it converts into the fire. It becomes depleted. And that's the pnimi, that's mamalikal almond. And you have to, it becomes assimilated. Yeah. The lavush lasts for longer. It represents something which is more makif. Yeah? And you also wear it a whole day. Not like food. Because your rotzain is actually a higher and deeper place in the self. There's something even deeper. Clothes you could take off. Person goes into bathe, person goes into the mikvah, person goes to sleep, other situations, the person takes off their clothes. Sometimes there's obligations in halacha to take them off in different situations, in the appropriate situations. A bias, every moment I have a home. And on the other hand, the bias is the furthest from me. It's not in me, it's not even on me, it doesn't suit my body. A jacket has to fit you, a shirt has to fit you, socks have to fit you, a hat has to fit you. It's a makif, but it's a makif that's connected, it's tailored tailored, pun intended, to your body, and uh, even a talus. So a talus is taka, a, a broader makif, <coughs> but sometimes a talus is too small. There's no atifas ayishmelem, so you need a bigger talus. In other words, the lavush has some connection to the physique and the structure of your body. Just like we explained at length, 
about Soiviv and about Ratzin. A house, you could be in a huge house, you could be in a smaller house, it's called Makif HaRachek. What does Makif HaRachek mean? It's also a Makif. But it's the Makif, even the Gabi, the Makif of Lavush. It's remote from you, meaning it's completely beyond the structure of your physique. Food becomes me. A garment has to suit me. A house is completely beyond my structure. The makif of a person, ratzain, is beyond, but it's a ratzain for a certain life, and that's why it's experienced within your structure, consciously, like a garment. The bias represents what we spoke about at length, the superconscious. In other words, it's completely not suitable with my structure, with how I define myself. The way I define myself is already the way the makif is assimilated into my conversation, into my processing system. It's not happening on an unconscious level. So bias on one level is the deepest connection, and because it's the deepest, it's also not conscious. And therefore, it can't become part of you, and it can't even encompass you like a garment, because it's too deep to become filtered and trickled down and limited in the finite structure of the person. That's what bias is. And on the other hand, it's always there. You always have a home. You could be in shul, you could be in work, you could be on a business trip for three months in Asia. But you have a home. <laughs> okay. In that sense, isn't it something that is more on a lesser level? Okay. You're right. On one hand, it's much further than me. Because this element of a person, we're talking here in the source of bias. The physical manifestation of bias, like everything physical, it can be understood, in, you know, it could be, it could also be misconstrued. We're talking about the concept of Mazen, Levush, and Bayis in its ultimate shayrish, in its ultimate spiritual divine source, is Mamale, Soiviv, and Pnimiyas HaKeser, Atzmos. It comes down in our world in these three components that the Rebbeinu Shalom orchestrated that are all parts of human life. So my house in many ways is me. But what do I mean it's me? It's not my food. It's not my clothes. But even when I'm far away, I still have that house. And this is what's called Makif HaRachek. On one hand, it's deeper. It's a deeper eye than any other part. But it's an eye that I can't easily access and define in words because it's so beyond, it's so transcendent. And therefore, you don't eat rocks, you don't eat earth. And garments are not made of rocks or earth. I mean, try wearing a rock, it's not so easy. It's the, on, it's the deepest, but it comes down in the lowest. And sometimes that's how it is. The highest things come down in the lowest expressions. The Bakim symbolizes um, what happened with Yitzchak and, and Rivka at that time, and with both and his daughters at that time. Also, yeah, why Light was sleeping. That's what we discussed in the previous show. Why Light was sleeping, why Yehuda didn't know, why... Uh, and we'll soon see that the homes were being built then. The Hebeis Hakebeis Pites. We'll soon see. David HaMelech represents Malchus. What's Malchus? What's real Malchus? Real Malchus is power that comes together with powerlessness in the deepest fashion. David HaMelech's greatest power was the fact that he felt powerless. The fact that he looked like a, he felt like a child, an infant, in the bosom of its mother. In a paradoxical way, that made him the most powerful person because he was the most powerless person. If he would have felt not like an infant in the, womb of, in, in the bosom of its mother, he could have never had that power. They say that power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power is a very, very dangerous tool. We all know in our lives, you sometimes encounter people with power, and it's sometimes very hard and it's, it's not about judging anybody, it's a test. Just like when a person is blessed with wealth or a person is blessed with great wisdom or with great other talents or skills or gifts, one of them is power. And if you look throughout history, people with power have usually or very often abused it. Until today, people with power abuse it. Some of you have to deal with these people constantly. Huh? Politics and, and, and judgments and... Uh, and fears and insecurities and so forth. Oh. So that's why a melech is a very dangerous thing. <laughs> he felt that tremendous uh, docility and vigil inside. He needed an external reminder of it. 
Well, the Melech needs to have two Sifra Taira. Every person has one Sifra Taira. And the Melech needs two Sifra Taira. The Gemara has an expression of Mesechus Brachas, Davchov Beis, HaMelech Kivan Shekara Shuv Enei Zaykev. Usually by Shemin Esra, we go Baruch Ata Hashem, and then we pick up our heads, and we remain standing till the end. The few times we bow. A Melech, right in the beginning of Shemin Esra, Kivan Shekara, he kneels, he prostrates himself, Shuv Enei Zaykev, he's not allowed to pick up his head till the end of Shemin Esra. It's a great time to pelt him with, uh, with rubber bullets or with uh, sroigim or with her shyness and Aravis, right? He's down. That's it. He can't do anything. It would be strange. Everyone is standing as I, and the Melech is down. But it's really the same Nekuda. What gives him the right to be a... What gives a person the right to have power over another person? The answer is nothing. <laughs> we don't have the right to have power over people. That's why it says in Parshas Bahar, Avod Dayheim. What do Chazal say? Rashi quotes, Veloya Avodim La Avodim. You are my servants, and therefore you're not allowed to be a servant to anybody else. And nobody has a right to exercise power over you because I am the sole master of all humanity, and you are not superior to anybody else. Which is why the Torah so limits so much the laws of slavery. Six years, and you're not allowed to do this, and you're not allowed to do this, to the point that the Gemara says in Kiddush, and you're not allowed to do if you purchase a Jewish slave, just know that you just purchased a master. It's like hiring a Jew. <laughs> it's very hard to have a Jewish employee, right? <laughs> yeah. What gives the Melech a power to, give, to exercise power over another person? There's only one answer. If the Melech sees himself as completely nothing as a conduit, as powerless. In other words, my entire agenda here is to be able to be here for the people. That's why we say, Malchus leislam egar maklum. The Zayar says, Malchus has nothing of its own. It's like the light of the moon. The moon doesn't have its own light. It reflects the sun's light. The moment the moon grows arrogant and starts thinking it's its own light, it's not the moon anymore. The beauty of the moon is that it reflects the sun's light. Because Malchus has that sense of selflessness, Therefore, it can have more power than anything else. Therefore, it can have more kayak than anything else. Because that's where your greatest power comes from. Because it's not my power over your power. If the Melech feels that way, then it's a whole different story. And many kings did. They fell prey to that moment, to that position. There were very few who can really tune into that place. The greatest leaders of the Jewish people are the leaders who experience themselves as the greatest slaves of the Jewish people. And this is not stam an expression. It says this clearly in Chumash, in Tanakh, when Shlem HaMelech passed away and Rechavim wanted to uh, increase the tax burden, and the older advisors told them, mistake, let the people give them a lighter time, uh, an easier time. And they said, if you will be an Eved for this nation, then they will, you'll be able to be a king for this nation. So the Gemara says in Hurius, Tafyu, that Ram Gamliel wanted to appoint two of the sages as leaders, and they said, We're not interested. We don't need this position. And Rabbi Gamliel said, and I quote, You think I'm conferring upon you leadership? I'm conferring upon you slavery. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that you don't have to respect the king. You have to respect the king. And Amorid B'malchus was Chayiv Misa. Why? But why? The moment the king starts taking his ego seriously, then it's already not the Malchus that Yiddishkeit advocates, embraces. The whole Nekuda has to be Fakert, more bitter than everybody else. Because I have so much power, I have to be more powerless. So then my entire power is not me. I'm a conduit for, um, for leadership. I'm here for God and I'm here for the people. So the entire, and then the person can have a power that is beyond any other power because the power is not defined by his own ego. It's, de it's defined by God. And therefore it assumes the infinite properties of its creator. And therefore it has a fearlessness to it that any other power would not have.
Huh? Like the concept of shame. What do you mean? That it only can yeah. be, can be yeah. present. Yeah. And that's why we learned before that Malchus and Nesias are one of those things that if you want it, then you don't get it. It's like shikh. Why? There's people who want power and they get it, but it's not this type of Malchus. Right? Rabbi Yehuda ben Tabir, Rabbi Shimon ben Shaddach, they ran away to Mitzrayim. Look at Moshe. Hashem is begging him for seven days. I don't understand. The basis of every Jew is that God says, you do. Hashem betzach, seven days. At the end, every excuse you come up with, as though God doesn't know, it's, like, it's almost like in yeshiva with the principle. Hashem says, I want to appoint you. He says, oh, oh, oh. Me anoichi, I'm a nobody. Oh, as though God didn't know you're a nobody, right? So he says, what do you mean you're a nobody? I'm, I'm, I'm choosing you. You're going as much lich. So then he comes up with a new one. I don't know how to speak. <laughs> I didn't know that either, by the way. Moshe, let me teach you something about God. I'm the one who allows people to speak. You're good. So Moshe says, oh, they're not going to believe me. Oh, God, I never heard that one. They'll believe you. So Moshe says, yeah? Do me a favor. I have a brother. Go find somebody else. It's mamish antithetical to everything. And then Moshe tells the Jews for 40 years, you got to listen to God, listen to God, listen to God. So what's the oimek here? This question, the, in, in this maimah, the way the Mittler ever wrote it, he asks this question. <laughs> here it's Bekitzer. What, 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 so he says, he says that's the only way he could be that person. <laughs> the only way he could become that person that God wants is if every fiber of his being said no way. That was part of the mitzvah. It's like shikha. <laughs> If, if God says, become the leader, you're going to become the greatest Rebbe and leader in all time, Moses will become the man, you're done. If God would show him his Wikipedia page and how many times he's mentioned to Google and Moshe says, that's oh, not bad, not bad for a nice Egyptian little boy, then you're done. What made Moshe the person was that every part of him said no. Huh? Adam And that's what made him the most powerful person. Because it wasn't, he didn't need it for his ego. The moment I need leadership for my ego, then I'm a slave, I'm not a leader. I need the polls, I need the people to like me. I'm serving you, I'm a slave, I'm not a leader. Because Moshe didn't need it, it didn't give him anything. Fakert, it was a compromise. So why are you doing it? You're doing it to serve. You're doing it because that's what the people need. So then, it's a different type of leadership. Then you're a genuine leader. Then, it's a choice. You're doing it for the people. You're not doing it for yourself. Those pictures don't mean anything. The covet is, is, is a distraction for you. The compliments are a distraction for you. And then you can also deal with criticism because real leaders deal with genuine criticism. How do you not go into a depression? You know, real leaders throughout history, it's not posh. Put yourself into their shoes, what they have been through. And I'm talking about the real people, what they have been through, the nudniks and the lowlifes. And how do you do it? It's very hard. Moshe at one point says, kill me. And Parashat Zbala is hargeni naharai. The answer is always one answer. You don't take yourself seriously, but you take your cause very seriously. Other people is the exact opposite. They don't take the cause seriously, but they take themselves very seriously. It's a different picture. It's a different story. Moshe never takes himself seriously, but he takes his cause absolutely seriously. And that makes all the difference. So you could remain completely human, and David HaMelech says, I'm just like an infant in the bosom of my mother. And yet, he can make decisions that are decisive and require tremendous courage and tremendous power. It's never about my ego, and therefore his power becomes actually much deeper because it's divine power. Shlucha shaladam kemoisa. If you see yourself as a shliach of Hashem, so who do you represent? You present something that's infinite, so that's who you become. But if I'm only my own man, I'm only my own man, which is nice, it's good, but it's limited to my own little ego. So if I want it, I don't get it. Then I'm in a different place. If I need the leadership, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Some people want leadership. We know that. We have political candidates who will spend millions and millions and hundreds of millions, ah, uh, that others should elect them as a leader, right? For Moshe Rabbeinu, it was like called, it was a punishment. <laughs> but that opinion of David should have you, right? Yeah, so that pchin is in everybody. David was a, a, a revealed. So Malchus is the lowest of the ten spheres. 
it's a mamish on the bottom. As it says, it's makabal, it receives from all the other nine. On the other hand, it's rooted in the deepest place. Because we see, what is malchus? Just to give an example. Somebody becomes, is appointed to become, the, is sworn in to become the new president of the United States of America. What did they learn that day that they didn't know yesterday? Nothing. Somebody is appointed to become, uh, uh, excuse me, the medical chief of one of the greatest hospitals in the world to go on the top. What did he learn that day in medicine that he didn't know yesterday? Nothing. And somebody is appointed to become the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company that day. What did he learn about business that day that he didn't know yesterday? Nothing. So from an external point of view, you would say, so nothing changed. And yet we know he's a new person. When he comes out of the office that day and he goes into his car, he's a different person. The president is a different person. This leader is a different person. What happened? Malchus le'islam It's not like he got a, a shear in the morning that changed his perception. Whatever you knew yesterday, you know today. <laughs> all the flaws that the president had yesterday, yesterday. And all the virtues he had yesterday, he has today. And all the knowledge he has yesterday, he has today. And all the wisdom he had yesterday, he has today. But he's a different person. He became a melech. Ein melech belayam. Malchus, I don't necessarily mean in the ultimate form of kingship. Malchus is every leadership. You were appointed by people to a top position. You look in the mirror and you see, you feel a different, you're a different person. That's a very, very deep thing. Where is that rooted in? On one end, it's the lowest because it's late. It doesn't have anything on its own. It's just makabel from chachma, bina, das, chesed, gur, teferis, netzach, chayd, yisoy. Malchus doesn't have any substance of its own. Whatever you had yesterday, you're going to have today. What I knew about medicine yesterday, I know today. What I knew about law yesterday, I know today. What I knew about politics yesterday, I know today. Maybe the CIA will brief you about uh, certain secrets that you didn't know yesterday. Huh? huh? UFOs, the black suitcase, etc. Fine, I understand there's certain confidential information that I may share with you that day or the day before. But you understand my point? But on the other level, there's a transformation that nothing else can cause. You're a different person. What makes you different? What, the same knowledge. Well, you don't know anything more. Your personality didn't change, but everything changed about you. Every koyach of yours, what is it? This is a very deep idea. Malchus is rooted in the etzem hanefesh, makif la makif. What happens now is every one of your faculties is infused with a new sharpness that comes from your essence. You operate on a different level, on a maximum level. You're operating. Every one of your faculties is accentuated and infused with a vitality that comes from the bias, from the makif harachak, from the deepest place of the self. So on one level, malchus is nothing. It has no substance. Like the moon doesn't have its own light. Leadership basically is the person I was yesterday, I am today. I just now have to facilitate or bring it into this office, to this job. So on one hand, Malchus, there's no new addition. Nothing new was added to my, my, uh, my resume, my portfolio. Nothing new. And yet, everything is new. Everything that was there yesterday is concentrated. And it emerges with a certain acuteness, with a certain intensity, with a certain depth. Because you have been given that moment of uh, responsibility. Suddenly the whole nation is under you. Suddenly the world depends on you. Or the hundreds of patients depend on you. Or a huge hospital, or a huge university, or a huge company. You're, you're, you're a different person. You're a different person. It's not just your salary was raised. Yeah, that's always good. <laughs> what happened? Your malchus came out. And this you can do on your own. You need the people for this. If you go up to a mountain and you meditate for 50 years, you can do great poetry but you can't feel Malchus. Malchus, you always need the feedback. It's the people. It's people who are outside of you. You cannot become a Melech on your own. Ain Melech Belayam. Everything else you could do on your own. Malchus is about the experience of the self that emerges from people choosing you and giving you that position of leadership and it just puts into focus everything that was there before in a new way. You know when you have a camera, and you're fo but it's not focused, so you have everything there, but it's blurry, and then it becomes sharp, that very, every element of your personality now becomes so sharp, and it's in focus. Why? 
because Malchus, the lowest sphere, is rooted in Keser. That's why we have an expression, Keser Malchus. No, it's Soifan, but Chilosan. So Malchus brings out your core. And now your Chachma, your Bina, your Chesed, your Gvuri, your Tveris, your Netzach, your Soif, are shining and facilitating and bringing to, fore, bringing, to, bringing to the fore not only the external dimension of the Midah, but the way the core of you infuses the Midah. So they're all operating on a different level, with a different level of intensity and vitality. Something new happens into each of them. Why? Because the bias came in. The makif la makif came in here. Malchus somehow brings that out in the person. So it's a different person. Even though, on an external level, the makif and the panimi are more or less the same. But there's an intangible makif la makif that is now coming out in Malchus. Some of the Jewish kings become such rishoyim. Ah. Listen, for the, for the have bittel in power is a tremendous, tremendous quality. It's very, very difficult. It's extremely difficult to have so much power and to say, I have nothing, I'm a baby in the bosom of my mother is very big Nisaya and it's not simple. You know what I mean? Because you do have the power. And you have to have the power because if a king doesn't have the power, he can't be a king. If a king says, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, if you're going to be indecisive, you will, it's going to be a disaster. So it's very, very difficult to maintain that humility that you're always connected and you're just a conduit. You're not, you're not the master. You don't own anybody. You don't own this world. You were created. You were given a gift. You were given a mission. And that's your job, to do your mission. You're a conduit. Listen, we all know, think in your life. It's not an easy recognition. When you have, when you're blessed with something, you want to own it. It's not easy to say, I don't own it. And I work, I'm a servant to God more than anybody else. That's who, that's who I am. How, how easy you think that is? Huh? It's not easy. In fact, there are places where the whole incentive to motivate youth is you say you're going to become a godl. You're going to become the most powerful person. Everybody's going to respect you. Why is that such an incentive for people? You're going to be a godl. There's people, they work for years and years and years to hope they're going to become a godl, right? Huh? <laughs> They'll have your picture, yeah. I once saw a story about somebody. He said that in his dormitory in yeshiva, he had pictures of a bunch of gedolim, and in the middle he had an empty frame. So they asked him, what's this? He says, this is for me. And this is what motivated him. And this is what inspired him. This is, this is for me, yeah. So, the moment you start learning chsidus, you understand that this is, it's like Nebach, right? It's like a Nebach story. But, but perhaps. He was, a he was nothing, he was a nothing. He was a good old picture. <laughs> <laughs> But well, what, what is it? It's, it's, a, it's a base incentive. In other words, you'll be a godl. So what does it mean you'll be a godl? So, so when the, the magazines put the pictures of G'dayl and burning chametz, you'll be in those pictures. When you die, they'll write a biography about you in the first few months. Yeah. They have the biography already ready. Biography is ready. We all know, covet is a very deep incentive. Very deep incentive. People pay a lot, a lot of money for covet. Why? It does something to a person. They walk into a room and everybody stands up. There was a levaya of somebody. Oh, so it's a Nebuch story, but I'll just tell it to you. So somebody gets up at the levaya and he's eulogizing this person. So he wants to bring out his greatness. So what was his greatness? That wherever he went, he went to a chasana, he went to a bris, he went to a bar mitzvah, he went to an event. He always walked with a gemara or with a sefer. So they asked him why. It's not, you're not coming to learn, you're coming, whatever. So he said, because I knew when I walk in, everybody's going to stand up. So I may feel arrogant. So I came with the Gemara to tell myself they're not standing up for me. They're standing up for the Gemara. So now I remain humble. So somebody told me the story and he says, isn't that unbelievable greatness? So I said, I guess his humility was as deep as his belief that they're standing up for the Gemara. <laughs> That's how deep his humility is. <laughs> when, you, when you're not typhus, the epidemius of Yiddishkeit, so things could be very, very superficial. And motivations can also be very superficial. The ego plays a major role in life. That's normal. 
we all have egos. I don't know about everybody sitting in this room, but I know about the one speaking. People have egos. This is part of life. When God becomes reduced to the ego, that's what tragedy is. When Yiddishkeit is nothing but the ego, then you miss the boat. The fact that we have egos, we have egos, of course. And you make decisions based on egos, yeah. But you have to know. Anoichi oimed bein Hashem u'beinechem. The Baal Shem Tov, right? Anoichi oimed bein Hashem u'beinechem. It's the Anoichi. I have an ego, but you have to know. To give an example, there is a certain animal, a swine, a chazer. It likes to play in, um, in mud and even excrement. And sometimes you could see it wallowing and uh, going to the mikveh and, and submerging itself in the quagmire of, of, of excrement, right? In Yiddish, there's a word for it, yeah. Right? Uh, now... All of us have that, I should say, many of us have that quality too. We, uh, a part of us licked in the, what's called, it's, a, it's, it's an excrement. Schmutz, yeah. But there's a big difference. When you learn, when you discover the depth of Torah, the depth of Yiddishkeit, you can identify it as excrement. <laughs> That's the difference. It's not that you're not there anymore. You're still there, but you can identify it. You don't turn that into the pinnacle of spirituality. You understand? This is, this is what it is to be a human being, and it's part of serving God too, understanding the struggle in this nature. Yeah. So that's why we, we, learning about this is valuable. Not that it takes away your ego. It doesn't take away your ego. But the moment I can identify and I say, this is coming from the chazer of me that needs to go into excrement, okay. <laughs> so give it a little caress. And say, okay, now it's time to go to the shower. <laughs> now it's time to clean yourself up. Clean yourself up, let's move on. So this is the Nekudah, uh, your Teufel's divide, that Malchus on one hand is the lowest of the sphere. It's like Avonim, it's Afar. The real Melech is Doimim, Doimamti. David says, I have no voice. In other words, I'm nothing. I'm a complete receptacle. Like a little baby is completely dependent on its mother. Doimamti, I'm like a rock, I'm like earth. I'm a Doimim. I have no uh, adoimim. You ever see a rock step on me? Everybody steps on it, steps on it. It doesn't protest. The sidewalk never protests. But on the other hand, it never goes to therapy. Stepping on it your whole life. The sidewalk never suffers self-esteem issues. We say every morning in davening, at the end of Shemunah, v'nafshi ka'afar la'kaltiya. My soul should be like offer for everybody. I mean, like offer like everybody. My soul should be like sand, like dust, like earth. What does it mean? Lakal, for everybody. In other words, you should look at me and see me what? As offer, as earth. So you could step on me. So that's really what you want for your children? <laughs> Before your child goes on the bus to yeshiva, you say, Chaim, let me just tell you the rule of life. Try today to be like dust and earth for everybody. <laughs> that what you want for you? Why are you asking for that? But there's something very deep here. There's something very deep. And Toysfus <laughs> says it basically over there in the Gemara, the Brachas, I think, Daf Yud Zayin. People step on offer a whole day. And what happens to the offer? <laughs> it gets destroyed? No, it's fine. doesn't get destroyed. Hakalayim in offer. It never sees you could step on it, jump on it. On the contrary. It remains fully intact. We're davening, v'nafshi kafal akalti in life. So there's people step on you. But you should remain like offer, unaffected. Why? Because your ego is not rooted in ego. Your ego, your true sense of self, is rooted in the ultimate source of self, and then nothing can destroy you. Nothing can destroy you. That's doimem, and that's the real melech. The real melech... Is like a doimim. He looks at himself like offer. And because of that, hakalayim in offer. Everything grows from the earth. The earth, which is earth, everything comes from it. Everything grows from it. Why? Because of its bittel, because of its lack of ego, it becomes, it assumes, and becomes the source of the greatest life on the planet. Because of that. So David Amalek is doimim, his malchus, his doimim. Ultimately, 
is rooted in the deepest self and in the ultimate self, and it triggers and it brings out that deepest self. And that's the, con- that's the reconciliation between David and Tehillim and David in, uh, in Tanakh. Okay. Since it's like Boim, I'll just tell you, it says in Zohar, uh, we say in Parshish Kisisa, Shalosh Pamim Bashana, Yerah Kol Schurches Pnei Ha'adin Hashem. Three times a year, everybody should go see the face of the Master Hashem. So the Zohar says in Parshish Kisisa, and I quote verbatim, Man Pnei Ha'adin Hashem, who is the face of the Master God, who is it? So I would think the Zohar would say, I don't know. God doesn't have a face, right? The Zaya says, Da, Reb Shimon Bayechai. Who is the face of Hashem? Reb Shimon Bayechai. That's what the Zaya says. The Zaya Kaddish. What's the meaning of this? I mean, the basis of Judaism is that every person has direct relationship with God. There's no intermediary. The Pshat is, uh, <laughs> well, he didn't say it about himself. Uh, he and his Talmidim. And, if he, and if, if he did write it and edit it, it makes it even more strange. So he's saying it about himself, right? It's really exciting. The Pshat is, uh, when, you're, when your self is nothing but a conduit for the divine self, you can write about yourself <laughs> these words. <laughs> Rashbi says in Zohar, I am a simon. It's like when you see a sign and the sign says, go here in order to go to the store or the museum. So what's the definition of the sign? It just points you in one direction. It's my very eye is a simon to the presence of Hashem in the world. And this is the difference between a gadol in real Judaism and not in Judaism. We don't believe in people, ever. We don't worship people. Ever, ever. Mordechai, lo yichra, lo yishtachava. We don't bow down to people, we don't worship people. Not small gdoilim, not big gdoilim, not very big gdoilim. In fact, a person who really feels himself like a gadol, <coughs> excuse me, is a reason to worship less. We worship only God. What is the Zoya teaching us here? When there's a person who ceases to constitute a separate entity from Hashem and his or her entire self is only a conduit for God. So then when I say, man pnei adon Hashem da Rashbi, you know why? Because Rashbi wasn't Rashbi. Who was Rashbi? Rashbi was a channel for Hashem, which means, enoid mulvadeh, Hashem is everything and everywhere. The ego blocks it. Anoichi oimed beinechem o bein Hashem. The ego, the animal consciousness, creates a mechitza. So when I experience myself, I experience myself as a separate ego. When a person transcends that ego, ego as an easing God out, and the entire self becomes nothing but a conduit for Hashem. So when I say you, who is the you? The you is man pnei adin Hashem da Reb Shem because the whole Reb Shem was nothing but a conduit. So you're never worshipping a person. You never worship a person. A person that his entire mitzvah is but a conduit, then you're not worshiping a person. It says in Ketush HaSlevi, Parsha Shoftim, I believe Yitzchak Badichever writes, I quote, Muter l'ishtachavus l'tzadik. Badichever, you're allowed to bow down to a tzadik. Really? We suddenly bow down to people? There could be an Isav of Zara. How could the Badichever say this? The way they understood a tzadik is different than we. In other words, I'll ask you a question. If somebody is called a godl, right? But once in 60 years, he does an Avera. It's not so bad, right? <laughs> it's not so bad. That definition of godl is something that's very dangerous. It means he's a person. My Sahara makes me sin. I don't know how many times a day do I sin. I should ask my wife. Huh? Okay. My Sahara makes me sin this amount. This one's Yitzhahara makes me sin once a week. This one once a year, and this one once in 60 years. The moment you start worshipping such a person, it's already, you're off. You're off. You graduated into a different place. It's very dangerous. You don't worship any godl ever. We worship Hashem. 
The, the only thing. When you have a person like Rajbi, that his entire Metzius is nothing but a lakus. He's a conduit for godliness. You're not worshipping him. There's no him. Einoid Mulvadai. His whole Metzius, his whole identity screams Einoid Mulvadai. There's no him. You're not worshipping him. That's the only justification. Such a tzaddik you can bow down to because you're not bowing down to a tzaddik. You bow down to Hashem. Stoifus? Huh? This says also in Yerushalmi. Yerushalmi says in Bikurim, it says in Chavakik, Vashem Behechel Kotre. We say in the Aftar of Shuz, Vashem Behechel Kotre. Hashem is in his holy chamber. So Talmud Yerushalmi says in Tractate Bikurim, My Vashem Behechel Kotre. What does it mean? So I would say it means Hashem is in his chamber. It says, Da, Rabbi Yitzchak, Be Rabbi Lazar, Be Kineshta de Kesarin. So Rabbi Yitzchak, the son of Rabbi Lazar, when he was sitting in his yeshiva in Caesarea, in Kesarin, and he was learning or teaching, this is Hashem Behechel Kotre. Zoya is a book of Kabbalah. Yerushalmi is a book of Nigla. It's Gemara. It says this in Yerushalmi. Hashem Behechel Kotre is who? Rabbi Yitzchak. How can the Gemara say such a thing? Hashem is Rabbi Yitzchak? This seems like a religion that's not Judaism. The answer is, it's a very, very subtle idea. If Rabbi Yitzchak was Rabbi Yitzchak, then it would be a betrayal of Judaism. The true essence of who Rabbi Yitzchak was, even in a revealed way, was complete bittel, a complete open conduit for the divine truth emerging through him, shining through him. So you say, Vashem Be'echel Kotche Dor Rabbi Yitzchak, not because God is Rabbi Yitzchak, because Rabbi Yitzchak's entire Metzius is nothing but a conduit for Hashem. So Mele Dor Rabbi Yitzchak, because Rabbi Yitzchak is not Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak is a no simon ba'alma, like Rajbi says. Man p'nei adon Hashem Dor Rajbi. Tzadikim daim on the bottom, yeah. Yeah. So you never worship a person. If you're worshiping a person, you're not in a good place. We don't worship you. We only worship God. Respect a person. You look up to a person. You learn from a person. You're inspired from a person. You don't worship a person. How do you recognize the difference? How do you recognize the difference? Oh. That question I cannot answer. The only thing I would say is, if you're looking with an MS, Hashem will show you. If you're not looking with an MS, He won't show you. But if you're looking with an MS, He'll show you. <laughs> so you ask him how you recognize the difference between um, your perception of a person or, um, or the person, what's coming out from the person. I'm not sure which question it was. It's a good question. If somebody's looking with an MS, they'll find. If they're not looking with an MS, they won't. Ah, <laughs> uh, same thing. Every father is a melech. Every mother is a melech. Of course. The moment you become, the moment it becomes an ego thing with your children, you lost the plot. You're going to listen to me because I'm stronger than you and I'm bigger than you. And you're, The moment you get insulted by your children and you take it personally and now you fight back to win, then you're not a father anymore. Then you're an insecure patient who needs therapy and needs his child to validate him. Which is fine, but just be aware of it. Don't turn that into fatherhood. Husband, the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? It's fine. It's normal. We need our children to validate us because we have very frail egos and we're traumatized. And we need our kids to tell us that we're wonderful and awesome and great and powerful. And we have power in the world and knowledgeable and good parents and benevolent, which is fine. But for that, you have a therapist. You don't need a child. <laughs> a child, you have to be a father, not a patient. A lot of parents are patients and their children are therapists. It's like, when you tell me you'll do the homework, what it just means is that I'm doing my job. So when you say you're not doing homework, what does it mean? I'm not doing my job, which means I'm a failure, which means you're showing me that I'm a failure. Of course I go crazy. I'm not a father. It's, again, I'm a normal person. I got my issues. But that's not fatherhood. You understand? It's the chazid, the dreitzach and the direk. Fine. So go take a shower, figure your stuff out, and now say, now I'll be a father. A father means that you're not here to validate my existence. 
there's an inner wholesomeness. When you can find your inner wholesomeness through your bittel, then you could really be there. You could be a melech, you could be a leader. A leader is a leader who doesn't need it. If he needs to be a leader, then he can't be a leader. He's this different type of leader. If I need the leadership because I need you to tell me that I'm a good guy and I need you to give me power, then I'm working for you. So if you make with your nose like this, I change my position. I can't be a leader. A real leader has to be a leader from within. That's why not everybody is a leader. Not everybody is a melech. But Beis David had a gift of malchus. Not everybody has that gift. Everyone is a melech, but there's levels of malchus. You know? David was malchus. It's malchus. It's a certain quality. And that's why the leader has a very small ego. He has no, the real leader has no ego. You can't insult him. You know, there's nobody to insult. You're a this, you're a that, you're a that, you're a that. You're not gonna get, he's not going to get insulted. There's nobody to insult. An ego could get insulted. When you have no ego, there's nobody to insult. There was once a, a scene, a video I saw. It, it made a very deep impression on me. There was a Yid I knew. He was very sick. He was, as a child, he was very sick, and he struggled with illness his whole life. He's already in Eilam Amos. He passed away in his 30s, or I think late 30s. He was, for years and years, suffered with a lot of illness. He was a rav in Florida. He had a shul in Florida. A wonderful person, a beloved person. His chavre loved him. <laughs> he once came to receive a dollar from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I don't know the background to the story. I'm just going to speculate from my own imagination, but it could be I'm off. I'm just telling you what I saw. So he came by to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would give a dollar and give a bracha. Sometimes people would ask. As he comes over to the Rebbe, he's in his 30s, to the Bavitch Rebbe. He goes, he's like this. You know, like your principal did when you were seven? Yeah, no, to the Rebbe. He's going like this to the Bavitch Rebbe, who's, I don't know, 60 years older than him, and the Rebbe, he's going like this. This guy, he was a very open person. My assumption, my assumption was that he was asking the Rebbe to help him get healthier or for blessings and he was deteriorating perhaps and maybe he felt <coughs> that uh, the Rebbe could do more. I, mean, I, I don't know, but he's going like this, okay? So it's not, you know, it's not very respectful to put it mildly. It's not like it's a classmate of the Rebbe, or, you know, it's a, a same age. It's, it's a chassid. It's a... He comes over to the Rebbe and he says, I'm very disappointed in you. He's still going, I'm very disappointed in you. He doesn't explain why. My imagination is it had to do with his health, but I don't know. So the Rebbe looks, listens, and I already got offended a little bit. I'm watching this. I'm like, you're a chutzpah yak. Somebody should smack you. Yeah. I couldn't remember what the Rebbe would say. Like, I thought the Rebbe is a cla was a classy person, an intelligent person, and a caring person. He'll probably listen and ask him why you're... I'm thinking, what would I do? I would listen. Why are you upset? And, you know, without skipping a heart's beat, without mamash, as I... The Rebbe says, <coughs> that makes two of us. I'm also very disappointed with myself. And that was it. I'm also very disappointed with myself. So natural. Like, like, huh? It was so natural. It was like, I was like, whoa. If it would happen to me, I assume, inside I would be upset. Right? But, you know, you make uh, this. And yes. Yes. A professional, what's bothering, like a therapist, what's bothering you? Why do you want to kill me? <laughs> Why do you hate me? You know, you try. And there's a part of you that really wants to know. There's a part of you that wants to shoot the guy. There's a part of you that wants to throw, you know. This, but like in the spot, he says, I'm also disappointed with myself. You're in good company. He said, you're in good company. I'm also very disappointed with myself. <laughs> He was looking at himself. He was also disappointed with himself that he didn't, he didn't be or reach what he wanted to reach. That was the end of the conversation. Pretty much, I think. You never, you never yeah. told him what was bothering you. I don't know. They had a relationship, probably in correspondence. I don't think it started then. They, uh, the Rebbe, I think, helped him a lot over the years. So. But this was just a moment. 
of um, could a person respond without an ego, huh? He didn't take it personal. Mama, it's not personal. How do you respond without an ego? It's, without an ego, you respond without an ego. Your wife tells you something, your child tells you something. Our egos are right away there. Can I respond without an ego? Mama, imagine your ego was dead. You actually listen to the person. It's like, okay, this is what he said. And basically what happens then is it's like, you know, you actually, you have a good comrade in me. I also have, I'm also disappointed with myself. It's a whole different re response. It's not just, it's not diplomatic to disarm the person. That's what the gurus will teach you. If you want to disarm people, agree with them. But that's just another game. It's another technique. Huh? Always. It's a much wiser game. If you come to me and say, Rabbi Jacobson, I'm really disappointed with you. Instead of telling you you're an idiot, I'll say, really? Why? Um, let me hear. You know, understand, even though I'm thinking you're an idiot. So it's part of the game of professionals. But here, it was a whole different idiot. <laughs> it was like organic. So that bittle is a very powerful thing. You can't fake it. Either you have it or you don't have it. But even if you don't have it, you can identify it. <laughs> you can be honest. What's what? Yeah. You don't turn your need for being a godl into religion. That's not... Uh, it's a superficial Yiddishkeit. That's what people are running away from. There is a book. Games that people play. <laughs> And it shows how people react to you know, things. For example, a person behaves childish. You can be his father, and it uh, changes the dynamic of the conversations. For example, a person becomes childish. You, you know, you become like his father. You, 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 you tie his shoes, and it changes the, the dynamics of the conversation. But it's not what you said, which is the emphasis. Yeah. Instead of playing a game. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard this story once before, but the ending was different. The driver said, I'm sorry. But I don't know if it's the second story or. That I don't know. I saw this many, many years ago. So I don't remember. But this is what I remember. <laughs> I remember the impact on me when I saw it. It's like this I didn't expect. Think, thinking that it's very interesting because by a year, by a tour a year, by a goy will have a big difference. A goy who has ego and, got, and wants to cover everything, it can be so dangerous. But someone who, someone who's, and I'm not justifying wanting to have cover or having ego, but since we all do, when when someone, their basic foundation is Torah and mitzvahs and and they, and they have an ego, they can still accomplish a lot of good. I know a friend of mine who, I've known him since he was little, and he became a rabbi, became a rabbi. And I knew since he was little that he had a stick with God. I knew. And he said, I think, I mean... The guy that brought him to good places. Right here? There was no way he was not going to become a rabbi. His father was a rabbi. And I, I, I think, I don't know, he might be, he might yeah. not have any guts, but he seems like he has guts. Yeah, yeah. But I see him, I see him with little children rubbing their cheek and, like make, and doing all these good things. And I'm thinking, he's, 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 he's So you know what? If somebody is a Balgaiva and they use their Gaiva to do good things, God bless them. Yeah. Life is not about becoming the saint. Life is about identifying who you are, what's right, and bringing the two together. <laughs> there was a yeshiva bacher who once went into the Rebbe and he said, I suffer from gaiva. So you know what the Rebbe told him? Zost haben midvas. I bless you, you should have what to be arrogant about. <laughs> If you're arrogant, you should have with what? Become something. Yeah. He didn't say, oh, you're a nothing. What are you arrogant about? He didn't say that. He could have said that. What are you arrogant about? It's like a joke. At this stage, this is what he needed. Okay. So now focus on self-actualization and become a great person. 
Is there room to grow after that? Yeah, there's room to grow. It's very important. It's never black and white, you know. Can I trouble you for that? What does the mean? Covid mean? Wealth and covered. Yeah, what you're asking. Covered is true respect, inner respect. You respect yourself. That's what I'm asking for. Yeah. And your children respect you. Your wife respects you. It's respect. It's not covered. I walk in. Uh, same thing, yeah. Aisha is wealth. I want to be blessed with wealth to do good things. And I want to be blessed with respect. I want to have a respectful life. Self-respect. And, and people around me. In other words, <laughs> I should live a life of dignity. You know, some people speak about their fathers and there's respect in their voice. And some people speak about their fathers and there's no respect in their voice. Sometimes you have a parent or a teacher and you respect them. You, they taught you so much. They taught you so much about life, about values. That's what you're asking for. Yeah, and they, it was who they were, who they were. So that's what you're asking for. I don't think you're asking for that when you walk into a room, everybody should jump up. Yeah, no, it means internal. Just like wealth. It could be misused, but you want, you know, covered can also be misused. But you're asking for real covered, for real wealth. Wealth that will be used in a very good way. For good things. Including tzedakah, etc. Yeah, the wealth, I never had an issue with covered, but I Okay, so you're ready? Right. So you're the color of my covered, a covered berech, a man, a color of Akra covered, a covered berech, a man. Right, that's so that's why it's not a contradiction. The Chazal wouldn't put in an expression. No. I think that's what covered means. It means inner dignity, self respect. You should be able to respect yourself. You know, you should look at yourself and say, I can do something to respect my choices, my behaviors. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.